be standing between everyone and lunch. So I'll try to move out quickly here. Um, I don't believe in 10 minutes I can turn you all into sea spray nistas. So I'm uh, just going to try and give you a feel for uh, the thinking and uh, what's being done and some thoughts about what's going on. And uh, to set the context for this, um, we know hurricanes are sensitive to the representation of hurricane models are sensitive to the representation of surface fluxes. And uh, usually we think of these as the sensible heat flux, the latent heat flux, momentum flux, and there's also a kinetic energy flux from the atmosphere to the ocean. And these are usually represented in these neat little uh, bulk relationships where you have a transfer coefficient, a wind speed, and an ocean air difference. So for the sensible, it's the air-sea temperature difference, latent air-sea humidity difference. Stress, it's the air-sea wind difference. And all the physics is kind of incorporated into these coefficients. And they're, these are pretty well known from 0 to 20 meters a second with tens of thousands of observations. And uh, a lot of the physics is understood. And these are probably the most successful parameterizations in meteorology. They can be very accurate on average. On the ocean side, of course, you have fluxes of momentum and energy into waves and currents, and you have the thermodynamic fluxes, which come from, which come from these plus radiative. So in ice, wind speed, sea spray becomes relevant. And the big issue is how much sea spray is there. You can characterize a sea spray as a source function, which is a function of size of droplets and a function of forcing. So we think the forcing of sea spray goes somewhere between wind speed cubed and wind speed to the fifth. Um, so what does sea spray do? Well, there's a direct heat transfer by sea spray because the water is warmer than the air, so the sea spray comes off warmer and it transfers heat to the air. There's an evaporation effect. The droplets get into the air, they evaporate, and then they fall back in. And there's an, at least one effect on the momentum flux through buoyancy because the sea spray is heavy, so it has it drags down the uh, air or consumes turbulent kinetic energy. Well, what does this look like? This is a picture of the ocean at about 30 meters a second. And if you look up, you see all that haze. That's all sea spray that's been blown off these waves. This is a laboratory picture showing a breaking region. The wind's from right to left. And you can see these little dots here are sea spray droplets that have been blown off this breaking region. So this, the breaking of waves is critical in the production of large sea spray droplets. And the source function I mentioned is an area, it's an area of flux. So it's really an integral, if you wish, of a volume source function. And you need, you need at least one other characterization besides the number of droplets per unit area per second produced. And that is some characterization either of the effective height, say the wave height, or perhaps an initial ejection velocity. Now this just shows how you can do these integrals. If you have the simplest possible case, a delta function source, then the integral of that is a constant flux and then nothing above that. So everything we do in sea spray is highly simplified to the most simplified ways to look at things because we don't know the details. Now, this is an amusing graph of flow over waves that kind of illustrates um, how the winds and the waves interact to make sea spray. This is the horizontal wind speed. This is the vertical. The wind is blowing this way. If you look at this, this is kind of a breaking wave here. And a critical thing about this graph is you'll notice the horizontal wind speed contours go right down to the, near the surface at the very top of that breaking wave where the sea spray where the droplet bubble layer is. So that's blowing droplets off in that direction. So I'm going to, um, one of the things we've been doing the last few years is trying to relate the production of sea spray to the energy going to breaking waves, because that's a breaking waves are, are key to sea spray. I'll skip the details here, but. Um, the energy going to breaking waves is a fraction of the downward energy flux in the 
coming from the atmosphere. So what does a droplet source function to look like? Well, back in the 90s, uh, a simplified way to represent this was some kind of a shape of a droplet spectrum and then a white cap fraction that's, the, that's a function of wind speed. So that would be wind speed to the 3 and a half power. And then uh, lately, we've been trying to relate the production of sea spray to the energy going to wave breaking. So this is a physically based model that includes energy going to wave breaking, things like the surface tension of the air-water interface, interscale of turbulence, and the wind speed at the wave top and the slope of the waves and things like that. So this is obviously a lot better because it's uh, more complicated. <laughs> so this is an example of one of these sea spray things looks like. Uh, these are a couple of functions. Uh, one was one of my functions, and one is Ed Andreas, shown at a wind speed of, uh, I think it's about 30 meters, 21 meters a second. And this is this, quote, new model, which has uh, been tuned to fit that. And that's actually an estimate from one set, one field program. So uh, within this model, we have a tunable amplitude function. We can ramp this thing up and down. So, you know, kind of modelers at heart. So what do you do with the sea spray after you make it? Well, you throw it into the air. And you, uh, the way we account for the thermodynamic effects is we just calculate how much sensible and latent heat is transferred from a single drop. Of it, and then we multiply it across the entire spectrum. S, remember, S sub n is a function of size. And then. Um, you do integrals, integrate over the spectrum. And now you produce equations for the sensible heat carried by the droplets and the latent heat carried from the droplets. So that's QL and that's QS. And note, they look a lot like the bulk transfer coefficients. Like these, now the drag coefficients or the transfer coefficients, there's an FA and an FB. FV is just a volume flux. They're different. They're integrals over the droplet spectrum. So if you know the droplet spectrum, you're going a long way to solving this problem. So now just putting it back in context, they're the original sensible and latent bulk relationships. And now there are new bulk relationships for the sensible and latent heat from sea spray. And these transfer coefficients with the original model are just constants, 0.125 seconds to the minus 1 and 5 times 10 to the minus And an example of what one of these things looks like, this is now wind speed. This is the latent heat flux. The green dotted line is the direct transfer, the one that's already in your model with a particular transfer coefficient. The blue line is the computed latent heat flux from the sea spray, assuming uh, an amplitude of a, a certain value for the uh, scaling of the drop spectrum. And you see they're about comparable at around 45 meters a second. Of course, if, if you want, you could set that to 0.1. And then instead of, instead of being 500 watts, it would be 50 watts. So the other major issue to deal with with sea spray is what's called feedback. And that has to do with the fact that when you throw the sea spray into the air, you can't expect it not to distort the thermodynamic profiles. If it's important enough to affect the fluxes, the fluxes are in balance with the profiles, so it'll distort the profiles. And the evaporation and the heat transfer depends on the profiles. So it's one another one of those damned meteorology feedback things. <laughs> so this is the profile, say, of temperature. Um, that's the similarity code profile that's probably in your model in this black line is what happens after you throw sea spray in here. So it's cooled off this droplet evaporation layer, and it's added to the humidity. So the environment the droplets are in is cooler and more moist, so they don't evaporate as much. So the droplets kind of fuel their own inadequacy, you could say. And we characterize that with these coefficients, feedback coefficients. There's one for the, this profile, and there's one for that profile and distorts the profiles of latent and sensible heat. So the latent heat is reduced 
in the evaporation layer, and then it's enhanced, and the sensible goes the other way. So remember, when you evaporate the droplets, the heat has to come from somewhere, and it comes from the sensible heat. So we have three or four parameterizations of this feedback effect. There's just an expression. This just shows one of them, which is taken from uh, Andreas in a manual paper on what happens when a droplet comes out, evaporates, and falls back into the ocean. So when you put in this, characterize the feedback as a change in air temperature, you go back to our original expressions, only you put in the delta Ts and the delta Td, that's the change in the dew point temperature, and you go through this and you can calculate now how the fluxes are affected by this feedback effect. And this has to be done iteratively. And this is an example of, as a function of wind speed, how much that droplet layer would be cooled depending on choice of another tuning coefficient, the feedback tuning coefficient. So the other day, somebody says you can describe an elephant with nine coefficients. So we only have two. Yeah, OK. So what does this look like? Well, the sensible heat feedback and the late heat feedback can be computed after you do all this iteratively. All this depends, on, of course, on your choice of the droplet spectrum or how much sea spray you're making. And this is a function of wind speed. The coefficients are, coefficients are 1, meaning there's no feedback effect. And then as you increase the wind speed, the evaporation coefficient goes down, meaning you're getting less evaporation. And the sensible heat one goes up, meaning you're getting more enthalpy. So feedback increases the enthalpy transfer from the ocean. So what are we doing in recently? Well, recently we added the mass stratification effect. And that has the effect of making the drag coefficient go down at very high wind speeds. So maybe it makes it level off the way Shuey showed a while ago, or maybe it makes it actually go down. I don't know. There's a couple of papers that uh, Jin Wen Bao and his uh, team have been working on. They'll be coming out pretty soon. We've been doing wind total work on this to try and study the scaling properties of the droplet. So we've had two experiments, Spandex 1 and Spandex 2. Um, and we're working on plans to enhance NOAA P3 observation systems. So we want to put in our W-band Doppler radar on the P3. It's got this is like a kick-ass radar, and it will see sea spray right down to the surface of the ocean. We already have the WSRA for waves, and um, we're looking at this controlled tether vehicle. How am I doing on time here? OK. So what I'll do here, we'll skip the discussion of uh, Bao's papers. Um, and this is. Uh, I'll just show this because this shows if you put a sea spray parameterization in H wharf, Bao has been working on this, you can there are considerable sensitivities to sea spray. And the momentum effect is a big one. So this the blue line is when you include the momentum effect. So you get um, a lot stronger wind speeds because your the ocean has gotten slipperier. That's the effect of the momentum. So we'll skip the spandex. But I just wanted to mention this, because this is kind of funny. The real problem with sea spray is we don't know how much sea spray the ocean makes, and we don't know how it scales exactly, but we have ideas. So one of the reasons for the laboratory work is to explore how the production of sea spray scales. Is it energy going to wave breaking? Is it stress, wind speed? wave height. But we need field measurements to actually pin down what it is. If we have field measurements at 30 meters a second and we know how it scales, we can tell you what it is at 60 meters a second. And so in Sea Blast, we put a sea spray measuring device on the P3s, and they went down and they tried to measure. Um, but they didn't go into high enough wind speed regions and low enough to really pick up the sea spray. They did go low enough to start choking the engines in salt. 
And people who fly on P3s don't like choking engines. So they're never going to do that again. So this is a scheme that the Surpass guys have come up with. There's a device like this you can hang from an airplane and put instruments on it. So we're, look, we're talking with them about a sea spray instrument to go initially on the air, aircraft and then maybe on the P3s. So there is hope between the radar and this, we will be able to get the sea spray measurements. So thank you. Thank you.